Income tax 2022-2023. Educator expenses. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information comes from the Form 1040 Tax Year 2022 instructions. Instructions for Schedule 1, Additional Income and Adjustments to Income, Adjustments to Income section, which you can find at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we are now focused on the adjustments to income. Remembering that the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement, although a strange one support accounting instruction by clicking the link below giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website broken out by category further broken out by course each course then organized in a logical reasonable fashion making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a youtube page we also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Where we have income minus the equivalent of the expenses being the deductions, getting us down to the bottom line, the equivalent of net income, this being the taxable income. Remembering that our objective is upside down, that is, we want the taxable income as low as possible, as opposed to in a normal situation where we want the net income as high as possible. So in prior sections, we looked at the income line. We would like to have income, of course, but we would like it to be exempt for taxes so we can have the taxable income in our formula as low as possible. When we're looking at the adjustments to income, it can be a little bit confusing because in essence, these are thought of or you can think of them as deductions, even though we can name it adjustments to income because we're decreasing, getting down to another subtotal of adjusted gross income. And then we're going to deduct the standard deductions or the itemized deductions to get down to the taxable income. Now, one of the reasons you might call it adjustments to income instead of like a deduction, some form of deduction, is because it's leading to that subtotal of adjusted gross income. And that subtotal is usually the number as opposed to the top income number used to do phase outs when we have phase outs of uh, deductions or phase outs of credits as people's income goes up they phase out the benefits you might get for certain credits and certain deductions and they usually base that on some format of the adjusted gross income instead of the top line uh, of income however you might also hear the adjustments to income be called the above the line deductions or you might hear them call uh, schedule one deductions the name could change as time passes. We now have a Schedule 1, which we didn't have before. So if that sticks around for a while, they might be called, you know, you might refer to them as like the Schedule 1 deductions. But the point is, they are different from the itemized or standard deductions that are on down below. Now, just from the deductions that most people kind of come to mind, most people think about. Think about it. Think about it, Jamie. The first deductions people usually think about are like itemized deductions, meaning the home mortgage interest, the property taxes, the charitable deductions, which are generally the itemized deductions, which you would only take if they were greater than the standard deduction, the standard deduction being dependent upon filing status principally. We'll talk more about itemized deductions later. The adjustments to income or the above the line or schedule one deductions are are good in the sense that if you have those deductions or if you're capable of taking those deductions you don't have that same limitation you don't have the limitation of needing to clear the standard deduction before you start getting the benefits from the above the line deductions the adjustments to income one of the primary examples would be like an ira deduction that's the one that probably comes to mind uh, most often for the adjustments to income now, also just remember that when we're thinking about deductions in general, that they are different from the credits on down below, which is an important distinction. If you got $1 of deduction versus $1 of a credit, you would rather have the dollar credit 
because that's going to have a greater impact, a dollar for dollar decrease in the tax that you would owe or an increase in the refunds you would get. Whereas a decrease in the form of a deduction is just going to decrease the taxable income. The amount of actual benefit you get from that tax will then be dependent upon the tax rates, the progressive tax system that is being applied and apply uh, to that dollar. Although it gets more complex than that because oftentimes the credits have income phase outs and whatnot. So it gets kind of messy in terms of, well, what if my credit gets phased out? My deduction doesn't get as phased out and so on and so forth. So that's the general idea. Let's take a look at some of the items and the adjustments to income. There's usually less of them uh, than, than some other formats of deductions and credits. So let's look at those. Line 10 on the form 1040, adjustments to income. Notice it's coming from schedule one now. Here's the schedule one, additional income and adjustments to income. This is uh, part two. And we're looking here at the uh, educator expenses now. First, let's remember that the normal and natural types of deductions we would expect to have in an income tax type of systems are those deductions that were necessary in order to generate the revenue. In other words, it would be natural for us to say, well, if you had to expend this money to generate the revenue, then we might tax you on the net income as opposed to the gross income, a concept we can see clearly when we're looking at the Schedule C, where we have, in essence, another income statement for the business income minus the deductions, which are expenses, in essence, getting us to the net income. We don't see that as clearly on many tax returns that just have W-2 income because we don't have all those expenses because we assume that those are incurred by the employer in that situation. So I point that out to note the contrast in other kinds of deductions, which kind of have a political nature to them, or the government is trying to nudge us or incentivize us, change our behavior in some way. When you look at the educator expenses, you're talking about a certain a group of people that work in a certain industry that typically get W-2 wages, but we have this educator expense credit designed specifically for them. And that happened quite some time ago. And it might be like the power of the unions kind of uh, at work and whatnot. Although you might say, well, that's still pretty small uh, credit at this point. And that's in part because it is an older credit. So this is something that was put in place a long time ago and it just kind of hung on there, although it's not been increased automatically all the time for inflation, and therefore the dollar amount has looked look more and more relatively low compared to, to, uh, to what it prior was, uh, for example, or to normal people's income at this point in time. So if people qualify for a qualified educator, usually you're thinking someone that's working as, as a teacher, in like K through 12, for example, then you would assume that they would generally get this credit. So it's something you just kind of basically be aware of. You're saying, well, what occupation do they have? If they're a teacher, then you're thinking they're probably gonna have this credit. Obviously they need the information to back up the fact that they spent this money uh, in work in order to, to uh, satisfy an audit of this, of this number, but Usually you would think if someone qualifies as an instructor and they're a full-time teacher, they probably do spend, you know, $300 uh, in order to a year in order to, uh, to facilitate the classroom. And there's a very low cap uh, on it there. So in other industries, obviously you might think, well, I do other stuff that's like important. I'm a nurse or something or, or something like that. I should get to deduct some of the stuff that I bring into my patients to make their room. I'm, you know, I'm bringing stuff for the room and stuff. People spend money on their work. Uh, but again, it was something that was specially designed in part, you've got to think, because the teachers unions, you know, kind of pushed that through. So it is what it is. So we got that special kind of thing for the, for the educator expense. So line 11 educator expenses. If you were an eligible educator in 2022, you can deduct on line 11 up to $300, a qualified expenses you paid in 2022. So again, the dollar amount is relatively low. It hasn't changed too much over time because it hasn't had an automatic increase uh, with inflation. So, 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 but it still kind of has stuck around this whole time. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing. 
So if you uh, and your spouse are filing jointly and both of you were eligible educators, the maximum deduction is $600, which makes sense. You got two teachers in that case. However, neither spouse can deduct more than $300 or the, of their qualified expenses on line 11. An eligible educator is a kindergarten through grade 12 teacher, instructor, counselor, principal, or aide who worked in a school for at least 900 hours during a school year. Qualified expenses include ordinary and necessary expenses paid. So that's kind of the general rule that you would normally expect on like a Schedule C type of business in a natural kind of uh, deductibility component. If I had to expend something in order to generate the revenue, I should be able to deduct that so that you tax me on the net income as opposed to the gross income. However, if you're a W-2 employee, most people don't get any of those deductions at this point in time because it's assumed that as an employee, your employer is taking care of that situation. Obviously, uh, uh, industries are different in terms of how much the, the employer is taking care of it. And when you're taking care of people like, like uh, nurses and teachers and whatnot, uh, I'm sure a lot, you know, a lot personal money could clearly be spent <laughs> that would, that would, that would uh, go out of people's pockets. But that's true for a lot of professions as well. So in any case, for professional development courses uh, you have taken related to the curriculum uh, you teach or to the students you teach or in connection with books, supplies, equipment, including computer equipment, software and services and other materials used in the classroom. So obviously you would want the backup to support this in the event of an audit and whatnot, but you would think that most teachers, if they qualify, would, would possibly have those expenses and therefore you should be able to, you know, assume you should be able to take the deduction generally if someone is a qualified teacher, you would think. So an ordinary expense is one that is common and accepted in your educational field. A necessary expense is one that is helpful and appropriate for your profession as an educator. An expense doesn't have to be required to be considered necessary. Tip. Qualified expenses include amounts paid or incurred in 2022 for personal protective equipment, uh, disinfectant, and other supplies used for prevention of the spread of coronavirus. So it was kind of funny during this whole time of, you know, the coronavirus w wasn't funny, but during that time, I thought it was kind of funny that they kind of advertised the fact that they've expanded the definition of qualified expenses so people can take this $300 uh, expense credit to include, you know, sanitary supplies and whatnot that you might have paid for in the classroom as if they needed that to reach the $300. Like, the, they didn't increase the threshold. They just said, you know, you know, I think most teachers already hit the threshold. You know, they didn't, didn't really do anything. So I thought that was kind of funny. But anyways, qualified expenses don't include expenses for homeschooling or for uh, non-athletic supplies for courses in health or physical education. You must reduce your qualified expenses by the following amounts. Uh, excludable U.S. Series EE and I savings bond interest from Form 8815. Non-taxable qualified tuition program earnings or distributions, any non-taxable distribution of Coverdale education saving account earnings, and any reimburse uh, you received for these expenses that weren't reported to you in box one of your form W-2. So for more information on those, uh, use tax topic 458 or see publication 529.